Hello everyone and welcome to the Booster Use of Google Workspace Summit featuring Google for Education and is delivered by Apps Events and Acer. We're glad you could join us today. I'm going to bring in my colleague, Veronica. Hi, Wendy. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you, Veronica. Did you want to start the uh, webinar off just to welcome everybody in? Definitely. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our free virtual uh, summit. Thank you for joining us. We are really pleased uh, that you are watching us, joining us, and just everything. <laughs> uh, I'm based. Uh, I'm based in the Czech Republic. So feel free to contact me in case of any questions, uh, any interest in training, uh, in hosting an event, buying licenses, just anything. Uh, Wendy, I'm really pleased uh, you are presenting uh, two interesting sessions today. Uh, I'm really looking forward to listening to them, as always. So thank you, thank you for that. Thanks, Veronica. I'm just going to go through a series of cows keeping, first of all, and just let you yeah. know some of the fabulous offers that are coming up. So I'll just take uh, Veronica out of the frame. She doesn't need to be there. Um, so the first thing I'm going to let you know about, if you want to get 60 day free trial of Google Workspace for Education Plus, which will give you all the great features, um, you can contact Apps Events on appsevents.com slash workspace and you will be able to complete a form there which they can get back in touch with you. It's well worth it. It doesn't cost you anything. You can try it out and see if it's right for your school um, and you'll just get blown away with the features that are in there. And if you'd like to get social and you're watching us, please use these hashtags. So use hashtag Google PD and hashtag apps events so i'll just pop these into the chat for you so you can see that so in case you forget what they are there we go this is what we want you to do please get social and pop those in so please tell people that you're attending these sessions because we would like them to be even better attended and as veronica said i'm delivering a set, couple of sessions today but i'm also joined by a colleague sharon planter who's going to give you a fabulous session as well so to introduce myself, I'm a freelance Google trainer, uh, innovator and educator and, and a coach. I haven't got that on there. And Sharon Planter, she's more than she says here, but I love this description, an enthusiastic educator with a passion for digital technology. I might have to steal that one. That's a really good description. So the sessions that are coming up are, first of all, Jamboard. So it's a space to engage all learners um, and all ages. So really, we see a lot of this being used in the primary and we want to look at it, uh, how we can use it in different ways with different age groups. So that's the first session of mine. And then we'll jump over to Sharon and she's going to do slides, hacks and tips. So she's gonna look at some of the um, uh, more interesting features such as question and answers and closed captions and animations. So something a little bit more advanced than just uh, a standard slide deck. And then I'll jump back in and I will do a Google Docs hacks and tips. So again, these might be some of the features that are brand new, like adding emojis um, and things like paint formatting and some of the other things which are just brilliant to use like checklists and translations. So we're gonna dip into some of those things and work through at quite a quick pace for this one. If you're attending and you can see this, please go away and make sure you fill this in. I don't mean go away, I mean go away and fill this form in when you've finished. But I mean go and fill this form in because you can win free seats to come to any of the apps, events, boot camps or summits. And that's well worth it because we've got such a lot coming up and you can see some of the features that we've got here. So let's see if I've got a link for that one. Um, yeah, I have, and I'm gonna pop that one in the chat as well, just so that you can make sure that you can fill that in later on. And thank you to all those people saying hello. I will say hello in a little bit as well. And then this great one, the data literacy for schools uh, and the power of data studio. So if you're interested in that, get in touch with um, james at appsevents.com and he will be able to book you onto this or you know tell you when the next cohorts are coming up so the fourth cohort is starting in September it's three weeks and it's a brilliant facilitated online um, series of sessions so if you're interested in data studio data studio and looking at how you can make your data tell you more then this is one for you 
And then ISTE certification, APS Events are the only UK provider at the moment that can get you ISTE certified. And there are four cohorts coming up. You can see them here. Please uh, take a screenshot, or I'm sure you might get shared this later on, but look back at the video and just see when the dates are and just get in touch with Apps Events. You can find them on Twitter if you uh, can't find them anywhere else, but Google for Apps Events and you will find them. They This course is wonderful because it's not just about Google, it's agnostic, so you can be on any platform, but it's really about learning how to apply the ISTE standards to uh, your teaching. It's something I've done myself and I can't recommend this enough. And then where would we be without Acer sponsoring these sessions? So we just want to mention the Acer Chromebook range and they are ruggedized and they are great for extreme heat, extreme humidity. That's brilliant for the UK at the moment. Uh, they're rain resistant and they can survive drops. So if you're interested in finding out more about that, you can go to Acer for Education dot e m e a at acer.com so again you can look at these slides and you can see who to contact so please have a look at the chromebook range you can also look at the international schools podcast which you can follow on youtube and you can find that on video.appsevents.com and i think finally uh, we can then go over to my session and i'll bring this slide up a little bit later on um, let's just find my first session. So this is me. I'm going to start the first session with you. So this is, is an interactive session. So I do hope that some of you will join in. I'm going to put some bit.ly links in. And if you've not seen those before, you can just copy them and paste them into a new browser. And you should be able to get into some of my documents and work with me. That's the idea. OK. So the first question really is when you're doing something about Jamboard is why are you using Jamboard? You know, there's lots of other things you can use. But the reason I particularly love Jamboard is it's such a simple interface. So when I start my students using it, whatever age they are, I can see that there's not a lot for them to learn. And the fact that there's not a lot for them to learn means they can jump in and straight away learn more about the topic they're learning and not having to think about the technology. So the simplest thing we can do really in a Jamboard is to jump straight in and brainstorm. So what I'm going to ask you to do here is there's a bit.ly link here showing on screen. I'm also going to pop that in the chat. And I want to see if some of you will join me on frame one of this um, Jamboard. OK, so I'm just going to pop in and see if any of you do jump in. Yay, someone's there already. Thank you. Um, so basically, there's two things on the screen there. And this is where if you've never used Jamboard before, try it out. So basically what you should be seeing, I'll just drag that on screen, is this is a, a straightforward Jamboard. I've just put a post-it note on, and another one here. If you want to add a post-it note, all I want to show you is you click here and you type. And I've suggested if you do one thing, it's blue and another it's pink. So have a look at the instructions on screen. Jump in if you'd like to. And just tell me if you've used Jamboard before, what's the best thing about it? Use a blue sticky note. And if you're new to Jamboard, how easy are you finding it to use? Use a pink sticky note. And I know some of you won't join in. And even if only one or two of you do, um, you know, you can always come back to this and try it again. I won't shut these documents down. You'll be able to play with them. So have a look and see if anyone wants to jump in and try it. Uh, basically, I just want to show you the very first thing that you can do that makes it easy to use. OK, so jumping in and um, I'll give you one more minute if anybody does want to jump in. Otherwise, I'll move on. OK, that's fine. So we have a chance to just use that sticky note on frame one. Ah, somebody's jumped in. Thank you very much. OK, so that's the easiest thing you can do. It doesn't matter what age group this is. It looks a bit boring because I haven't put any design on it. I've used it in the simplest way. This took me 10 seconds to, to get it ready, um, but it can actually be used in a lot of ways. We're getting information from your students. Now, the second way I might use this, if any of you that are in there want to jump to frame two, so just click and jump to the frame two. I use this slightly different. Thank you, John. You're in there already. Um, this is a similar one. I've put a background on this time. This true and false can't move, but I can move all the other bits on on the screen. And basically, I'm asking you this time not to use post-it notes, but just to add uh, a text box and to add your name. So if you think Jamboards are really easy to use, you can drag this into true. And if you think they're really difficult, you can drag it into false. Um, and again, this is a very simple design, but you'll see some more examples in a little while how you can use these with your students. It can be that you're asking them a question. Um, you're giving them multiple choice questions on Jamboard. 
the great thing is if you've got 30 youngsters on a, on a jam board or 30 adults on a jam board, you can see what they're thinking when you ask them the question because you'll see a few people sort of hovering like this. They're waiting for people to tell the answer. And I use it. I get them to drop it in. And then I might say, Lara, tell me why uh, you think this is true. Uh, and I might get some students who look like they were sort of uh, hovering around a little bit to tell me why. So I know that they haven't just uh, jumped in and copied somebody else. Thank you. I can see a few of you still on there. So hopefully you can see that's two ways we're going to do it. I'm going to jump out of this one now. You can carry on in there as well. And I'm just going to have a look at my next uh, slide frame and see what I'm going to do with you. So the first thing I'm going to do now is to show you some different jam balls. So I'm going to show you some examples and then I'm going to give you time to have a play with this and do something with it. So this is my first one. This is a brainstorm. It's exactly the same as the one you just saw, but it's got a nicer design on it. And this design came from Canva. So if you've never looked at canva.com before, that's your friend. You should go away and look at it and you should be able to Google. Uh, sorry, you should be able to search for Jamboard designs in there. And the great thing is you can edit it so you can take bits of the design off and you can also uh, change all the text. So let's have a whiz through some of these and then we can talk about uh, how I use them. So this one is one I use for when I'm teaching people how to do the Google exams. So I'm teaching them different bits of Google. Again, it's the names one I, and it's a multiple choice. And I get people to go in and have a look and tell me what they think about uh, the question. This one you can see is for a much younger uh, age group. And this image is, again, they can't move the caterpillar. All that's movable are the dots. And that's really important, especially if you're working with younger students. Because if you have all the elements movable, by the time the second student gets in, the first one's moved everything all over the place. But basically, all they need to do here is put the uh, things in the right place. So again, nice and straightforward. And this one you can see is more for uh, key stage four and five. So here it's a prototype thing looking for design thinking. And I might get my students to sketch something um, digitally or take a photograph and add it uh, as an image onto the design platform here. And then they've got sticky notes that they can do the tests and observations. This design came from Canva. You'll see a theme from this. Look at this, looking at anything, comparing things, which of these is an old doll, which of these is a modern doll. You can use this for lots of different age groups. Again, you can get them to put their name in a sticky note. Again, nothing in that I don't want them to move is movable. It's just the uh, sticky notes themselves that are movable. I love this one for primary, and I've also used this for uh, SEND students where you've got counting things where they can move things around and manipulate them. Again, the pond isn't movable, so that can be used for adults um, that need additional support or for primary. And this is a nice one. And this background was actually just designed in uh, slides. And I'm going to show you that in a second. But I, these were slides and these were images I've just popped on. And you can see that you can move them around. I'll show you the examples, then I'll show you how I've made it. Here's an exit ticket. You're going to use this before you leave the session, hopefully. You can do things like put maps in the background and then get people to manipulate uh, objects into place so that you can tell if they can find where these uh, places can be found. So we're bringing in geography. You can use it for mood boards, uh, sorting things. So you can sort sweets uh, into the right color and see if your students can do that. So again, that can be used for send and for younger learners. This one I've done about house plants. Again, I took this straight off a of Canva, but you could have this as a voting thing for any students, any age group, and they could be voting on absolutely anything. So don't look at this just about house plants. Think about what you could replace those pictures with uh, so that your students can use them. I love this one where you can start to uh, drag things around and make the, the money up to 76p. You can change that around. You can teach students a little bit more when they're capable. So if you then want to teach them how to bring things into a different order, that comes later on. Don't be afraid if you're working with young students to actually increase what they learn. So if you can see, well, actually, look, this would look better if the 50p was at the back and all the pennies were at the front. Um, you can then later, once the students know how to work in these um, jam balls, you can teach them that next stage. So scaffold the learning. Don't stagnate the learning for your students. Advantages and disadvantages. 
competitive analysis again you can use this and i'm just showing you some different ideas oh and a mood board again so i've given you a couple of examples there just to show you and now i want to show you how i do stuff with it so first of all i'm going to go into jamboard and um no i'm going to go into slides first and create a background and then show you how i put it into my jamboard so if i open up my slide deck and this is something you can do as you're following around uh, as you're following along and you can see all of these things I've just shown you. These are all things that I've put together in a slide deck. Um, and they're just boxes that I've created and colored in and with, with some text on the top of them. So I'm assuming that you know how to use slides a bit and use some of the features. But the bit you may not have realized is that from here, you can, uh, let's do the living and non-living. You can go to file, you can download. And when you download, you can download it as a JPEG. So that slide now is now an image, just one slide with an that's an image. So if I come back and I create a, a jam board now, if I come back in and bring uh, this jam board in that I was working on with you earlier, I can go just through and find a, a blank slide. And all I need to do now is set the background and I can click on image. And once I've clicked on image, I can browse and I should be able to then see anything that's in my downloads and I can double click on that image that I just created from my slide deck. And look at that, it's now something in my Jamboard. It's deliberately designed so they're at the top and there's space at the bottom because what I want to do now with my Jamboard is now I've got the static bit in place, I want to go in and use a different feature. And this time I want to use add image. And if I use my ad image, I can then search uh, under Google image. And the reason I love Google image searches because they're safe searches. So I can go in here and I can look for a cat, for instance. OK, so I can find a cat. Uh, it doesn't particularly matter which one I use. I can use the, the silhouette here. Um, and like all packages, I can reduce the size of it and I can lay it down here for my students can go in again, choose another image. And this time I might look for a magnet. And once my image is in place, you're getting the idea. So all the things I want my students to sort can become images down the bottom. Or I could have created them as text. So if, if I wanted it for slightly older students, I might actually put the words in rather than the uh, actual image. And then they can do the same thing. They can either put the word in or they can drag the image into the uh, box. The great thing is, as I said, the biggest thing is make sure you put a background in. OK, so nice and straightforward to do. Anyone had a go at that? I'm just saying hello to people now. I can see a few things in the chat. Anybody uh, used it like this already or are you learning things already? I'm hoping I've taught you something already. But just let me know if this is looking like it's the right pace. And then the other thing I want to show you about getting backgrounds, I'm not going to do this too much. I'm just going to dip into this. But if you haven't already got a Canva account, I'll just pop that into the comments for you. OK, uh, so if you can go into canva.com, you don't have to do that now, but please do it at some point. If you're an educator, you should be able to um, show that your teacher by showing them your la your um, work card, your ID card, and you should be able to get a free premium account. The account I'm in at the moment isn't a premium one, so you'll see slightly different. I've got a reduced set of resources I can use, but you can actually get everything for free. Now, all I need to do to know here is if I go to my search and I search for Jamboard, what I get here is a whole load of resources that I can use. And as you as I roll over them, you'll see some of them say that they're actually pro or they're paid versions. But this one, for instance, I can click on. And once I'm in that, in my Canva, I can take bits of this off so I can put a different topic in there. I can take bits of this off if I think they're uh, irrelevant. Um, I can change uh, the text here to something else. And when I'm happy with that, I can download this in exactly the way I did with my slide deck. Well, in a slightly different way, but in the, with the same sort of procedure. This time I would share it and I can download it. And it's telling me PNG is suggested, and I just simply have to download that. 
OK, so it's now doing that download. All right. So at the moment, I might be trying to download something that's not free. The great thing about the Canva ones, they are 100 percent sharp. When you do them in slides, they're slightly they're not as sharp as the Canva ones when you download them as images, but they're great to use. So either one, go away and find things that are, are great and free for you to use or start your own creativity in your slide deck and do that. So what I would like to do, Canva is fantastic. Yeah, it's got lots of templates. I can see people are saying they've used it. That is wonderful. That's what I want to see. So I want to give you five minutes. Um, and I'm not going to teach you too much about how to do stuff in Canva, um, in um, Jamboard, because I've shown you the most important thing. Um, I'm going to show you two more things, two or three things before we do this, but you can get ready. You can open up one of these addresses so it's either bitly play area one or bitly play area two i'll pop those into um you can all go in one to start with it's only if we get a big lot of people that i needed the second one but if you all jump into bitly play area one and let me just um show you a couple of things again before we go uh and then we can move on so I've lost my slide my jam board where's that gone okay that's all going so well, and I've lost my jam board. There we go. Let's bring it in again. Here we go. So I just wanted to show you a couple more things in Jamboard. I showed you how to set the background. That is the most important thing you can learn in there to do. I can't stress that enough, okay? Then you can look down these features. They are really self-explanatory how to use them. You've got a pen that you can go in and start to... Um, draw with. You've got an eraser. You've got something you can point and move. So that's the... Uh, I'm not on my thing here so you can point and move this one uh i showed you how to put the images in you can do different activities where you get students drawing circles around things and i think sometimes people forget to teach students that so because they look at the oh look but it's but it's covered it up so you just need to know how to go in and fill the color and make it transparent and as your students especially if you're working with younger ones that start to learn the real basic features and they do this a lot don't forget to scaffold in that, that new feature. So teach them how to draw a circle, teach them how to change the transparency. Um, and as a teacher, if you're presenting in Jamboard, there's a nice feature with the laser pen, which you can just temporarily just highlight something. The last bit I'll show you is very quickly here, then you're gonna have your five minutes, is if I click at the top here, this is a great feature. I can see two people are on, on frame one. I can see two people are on frame two, and there's somebody on frame three here. So I can see you're actually interacting with this resource, and I can click through and I can see what people are doing on it. If I want to add a new frame between them, I can simply click on add frame, and that adds an empty one, or I can just move to the end and actually add a frame at the end. So all those features are great. The last thing I did need to do is to know how to share it. And if you're used to sharing your Google stuff, you can see here that I've got anyone with the link is an editor. I can copy the link and I can paste it as I did in the chat. Now I'm gonna ask you a question. So coming back, have a think. When you're looking at the Jamboard, why am I seeing people that um, say they're an anonymous dolphin? Why am I seeing people with strange uh, animals, armadillo and a koala? Why am I seeing that? Who knows the answer to that one? I'll give you about 10 seconds. Who knows? Who wants to be brave and, and tell me the answer? Because actually it's really important to know that. OK, it's the thing that people don't often know. Uh, and this is the same of any tool that you do. If you, when you share something with a group of people, if you share it by clicking on share and you type their email address in, then when they open it, it will show you their name. If, however, you don't tell Google the person's name, but you actually just give them a link that you paste into like a meet or put on a website, they will always come up as anonymous. OK, so just be aware. Yeah, it could could be that they're still in your network. Yeah, it's usually because they're outside of your domain. Um, but it means if I share it this way, I can share it with anyone in the world very quickly, as you can see. OK, so what I would like you to spend the last couple of minutes doing about the last five minutes is to open your own Jamboard uh, or go into that one that I just suggested, the uh, play area one. 
And I want you to all grab yourself your own slide deck. Sorry, not your own slide deck, your own frame. And I see a couple of you have started to do it already. And just try one of those tasks. So I either want you to think of something really simple that you can create as a background and put in there. So great, this one's been done correctly. Um, somebody else can grab frame two and you might decide to just do a task that you can think of for your students with sticky notes. Um, so have a think. Are you going to find something in Canva and bring it back in? Or are you going to use a very simple one like I did and just do a sticky note activity? But just sort of give me an idea. Jump into play area one and I'll give you that bit.ly link again uh, because you may have missed it. Let me just find it again. There we go. I'll jump that into comments again. So you've got your bit.ly uh slash play area one. So if you've not jumped into this already, come in and join me in this deck and I can then see if any of you are actually uh, doing that task. So we can see one person's done it already. Okay, I'll just give you one minute to get in there and have a go. Some of you might be actually trying to create a, a board yourself, so that's fine. You might be trying it in something in Canva or doing something in slides to bring it in. But I just want to just give you time to do that because it's okay somebody talking at you, but I'd like to see if any of you go away and explore it and try to do a feature with it. Don't be frightened to give people that time to think in your sessions. You don't have to talk to them the whole time. I'll give you some time. OK, nothing else gone on there just yet. I'm going to see some people in there, though. So I'm not I'm not giving up on you yet. So this is the task. You have five minutes. Try one of these things. Create a simple activity in Jamboard or create a background in slides and add it into the Jamboard or find a background in Canva and add it to your Jamboard. OK, so I can see there are. Yeah, I can see people are jumping in and out of there. So I'm not going to give up. I'm just going to let you spend a couple of minutes doing that because you might be doing something in the actual. Excellent. So I can see one person. Excellent. Okay, it might be just one of you doing it, but let's just give you two more minutes to do that and then we'll finish off this session and these uh, play areas will stay open if you want to show me something you've created afterwards. If not, just go in and create your own Jamboard. Don't be frightened of it. Use the slides and use the Canva to make it a design that looks great for any age group. Okay, I think you're probably done. I don't think anyone else is. Oh, no, somebody's in there. See, it's worth waiting. Courage in my convictions there. Somebody was actually working. So thank you very much for joining in. I do appreciate that. And I can see some lovely stuff going on there. So this will be a lovely resource. So I'm going to give you one more minute to do that. If anyone else wants to jump in or to pop their background in they've designed, I'm just going to be cheeky and see if I can move anything. No, brilliant. This has been designed somewhere else and brought into Jamble. So wonderful. Exactly what we were looking for. Thank you very much for joining in. Excellent. So I'm just going to finish this off by giving you uh, the link back to the very first uh, Jamboard that I used in the session. And this, if you jump onto frame three, you'll see an exit ticket. So if anybody's there and you want to tell me what was most interesting about this session or tell me something you learned or what questions you still have, I'd really be interested in hearing that. So I'll give you the last minute of that to try this out with the exit ticket. What was the most interesting? What did you learn? And what questions do you still have? And then we're going to get Sharon to join us. So I'm going to leave people looking at that exit ticket there, Sharon, um, and I'm going to bring you back in. So 
I'll leave that exit ticket open and I'll leave the play area open as well. I'm just going to add Sharon to the stream. Are you with me there, Sharon? I am. Can you hear me? You are. Yes. I'm just going to bring you in. So while people finish that last little bit off, I know you use uh, Jamboard a lot, Sharon. What's your favorite thing about Jamboard, about using it? And, you know, where have you used it um, that's worked the best? I think using it within like starter activities, um, getting people's opinions and, you know, when the students see that it's nice, it's interactive and stuff like that, they contribute really quickly to it. So it's a good visual, especially if you're introducing a topic or whatever, you get to see where everyone's starting. And then if you have that at the end, you can go back, revisit it. It's, it's a brilliant tool. I think I so. Thank you. Like it. Yeah, I do. And I use it with adults all the time, as well as very young children. So, you know, I don't see it as being for a particular age group. It's just how you design the activity and how uh, you make it look that really has uh, sets the age group for it. So I'm just going to come out of my uh, screen. If you've got something you want to share with us, Sharon, there so I can bring it up on screen. I do. Um, I'm going to share my screen. As soon as you share that, I'll I'll get rid of my one. Okay. okay, so if you haven't yet used the exit ticket, please continue to do that. Um, uh, if you've enjoyed what you've seen, please put some stuff there because I think there's some little tips there. You don't have to have a lot of explanation with Jamboard. How are you doing, Sharon? You managed to share your screen? At the moment. Just a moment. Let me just come out of this again. Okay, thank you. I can see some people have filled in the exit ticket and I can see that you're saying that you've got some practical ideas. So I'm glad that was useful for people. Uh, I'll jump in and see what this last one. Look at that. How beautiful does that look that somebody's created? Put three apples in the basket. What a nice activity. Lovely. Okay. I like that. Um, can you yeah. Okay, Sharon, let me just get this on for you. Let me just uh, add that to the stream. And I'll take myself off, Sharon. So that means you can then carry on with your session. Okay. So hello, everyone. It's a really hot evening um but we're not complaining um we don't know how long this heat wave will last for i'm sharon planter and today we're going to be looking at google slides and i'll be taking you through some of the hacks just a moment i'll be taking you from through some of my hacks and through um some of my tips um for using Google Slides. So we'll get started. Okay, so for my um, hacks and tips today, we're going to be looking at using templates, adding more fonts than what you have, interlinking slides, and voice type speaker notes. So we're using our voices for that. We're going to try and get interactive with some Q&A um, sessions that we could do whilst running our slides. We're going to insert a timer and um, also have a shortcut key tip that I find quite useful for Google Slides. We're going to use some of the dragging and dropping skills that you would need um, in order to get your images in and also to crop the different shapes of your images. And then we have our emoji bullets and animated GIFs. So we'll make a start. Okay, so first things first, I couldn't help but hear people talking about Canva previously, which is an excellent tool that can be used also with Google Slides. But if you're thinking about saving time and thinking about making stuff look professional, Slides Mania and Slides Carnival are really good 
um, good websites that you could use for that. So, so I'm looking at Slides Mania here. It's free. If you want me to put that in the chat um, for you guys, you can experiment with it. It's really good. You, you can pick your um, templates here. It tells you what's trending over here. And you can pick different themes, which I find is quite helpful. It's the same with um, Slides Carnival, um, but it tends to be brighter colors and things like that. Um, I've actually used this here, as you can see here, mine is all to do with space. I'm just going to come out of this slideshow that I have here so I can show you a few things that happen once you have downloaded your pre-designed template. Uh, once you've picked the right template, you'll see that you've got a little drop-down list here. And you'll see that, that automatically your slide layout in your Google Slides will have all of the different options, all of the title and body and all those other bits that you can use in order to add new slides if you need to. Um, I tend to delete the ones I don't need and then I will go ahead and, and use it. So Slides Mania, love the way that it does these pre-designed um, templates. It saves me a lot of time um, whilst using it. So yeah, I think that's a good time saver. Why start from scratch when we have this? There are many others. If you know of any others that you might use, please add that into the comments so that I can see some of the other things that you might use in order to save you time with pre-designed templates. Okay. Has anybody got any? If you do throughout the, sh the, the segment, please do add it in into the comments. Okay, so that's the first one, which will save you so much time. The next thing is what we don't really think about. It's adding more fonts than what you actually have to your library of fonts. So again, I'll come out of this so I can show you in Google Slides. You can see that you have your fonts. So um, let's just get this up. Just a moment, let's get to the font. Okay, so you will have your fonts that you would normally, um, when you click into an area here, you see that it comes up. All right, at the moment, this one is called Slacky. That's what that's called. And of course, we've got a drop down list here of all the ones that we would normally have. But did you know that you could actually add more fonts to this list? So you just need to click on more fonts. And you can see it comes up with a list of fonts. Um, you can see here, um, my one was Lexend. I like the Lexend family. I use that a lot um, in my teaching because it's a very clear font. However, if, if you wanted to add more, over here to your left, you can scroll down and there's many more fonts other than what's listed um, that you can add to your list. So let's see which one I will add. Of course, if you've got your Google Slides open, have a go, have a go at um, changing your fonts around or adding ones that you might want here. I think I'm going to go for Oswald. And you can see it appears here. And I'll just do okay. And now when I look, you can see Oswald is there. 
it's just been added. So there you go, the most recent ones are added there. But this is a good, good tip for anybody that might be looking for um, adding more fonts to their presentations to make it more clearer or maybe more unique. So that is adding fonts. Back to our slideshow. Okay. okay, so the next one here we have is linking slides. Okay, now linking your slides is quite, well, basically it is using hyperlinks within your Google Slides. It looks good when you do these, um, it looks professional and it's a way of you just navigating around your slides. So for instance here I have one here so if I click on link in slides it will take me right back to hacks and tips which was my second slide and if I cl click here into link in slides it takes me straight to this as well. So there's many ways that they can be presented. You can see that I presented this in just bulleted points and I've just I'll show you in a moment how I did that and then we have a second way of doing this in which we could have a choice board in which you just click on any of these choices to take you to the current slide so let's just see how that was done okay so in order for me to have done that, if I go back to my using the templates here, I highlighted the text first. That's what I did. And you will notice that you've got a link, insert link um, button there, an icon. So once you click on that link, you can see it has the name of it, and you can actually type the slide number in here. I'm gonna show you on um, something that is not linked. So let's just go to, let me go to my interlinking slides. I'm just gonna highlight that. I'm going to remove the link from this. You can see I've got the dialog box there. You see it comes up, up with all these other options. So oh, if you can't see the slide that you want to link to, you just simply type slide. Watch your spelling now. slide two, two, which is where my menu is and you can see it here it says hacks and tips all right now it normally when it comes up it all depends on your background it can come up um black blue etc but because of our background i made it white so i've just clicked on the font color and i'm changing it to white and that's how you create links between your slides. Of course, you could do this when you are maybe guiding your students from one slide to another based on answers, based on their options, giving them menus in which they can investigate at their own pace and be independent learners whilst doing this. They don't necessarily have to go in the same order as you but linking slides is another way of you giving it a professional look keeping it interactive if you are sharing it with your students and it's quite fun to do i mean when it comes to linking slides um even my animation here is linked 
So it's linked to, to going back to my hacks and tips page. So you can actually do this with any object, providing you um, know that you're, you click on it and there should be the option to link and then you will see it. So that's linking slides, very useful, not just for text, can be used with images also. Have a go if you've got that going there. If you've got a slide and you want to create, um, put an image in and then create a quick link, you can do that. If you want to practice as you're going along, let me know if you've used this before. Are you one of the people that likes to use this particular feature of Google Slides? The choice board could be looking different. It could be a table. It could be mine's is planets because it goes with my actual um, template that I'm using. But you can use it in um, like notebooks tables, squares, so that it becomes a menu. Okay, so Google Docs has um, a voice to type um, tool that you can use. It's got that feature and you could use that on the document. However, the voice type feature is mainly for the speaker's note. Um, section in Google Slides. They haven't as yet come up with one that can actually be typed on your actual Google Slide, but um, they have got it for your, your notes. So let me just give you a demonstration here. So in order for you to use this, you would need to go to tools and there you have the option voice type speaker notes. Once you click on that you can see that you have this option here and it tells you to click to speak. So I'm going to demonstrate this. Um, if you have got your slides up and you've got the notes section Remember, that's where it will come out. So if you want to have a go with this, you can. So, hello everyone and welcome. Oops, don't forget to allow your microphone. So we shall start that again. Hello everyone and welcome. This is the way to take your notes for your Google Slides without typing. You just click on it to stop it and then you exit this way. You'll notice that it has it in different languages also. And it covers many, many languages as much as it has in Google Translator. So you can try it in another language. I know that this will be useful sometimes for me with my students. So I've had a lot of Spanish students this year and um, it's very useful for that. So this is your speaker notes. This is about you organizing yourself. And this is a great way of doing this hands-free. I mean, I've had an injury for about I say it's eight months with my hands and using this tool has helped me tremendously whilst planning my presentations and creating any notes. So voice to type, remember it's in tools and then it's voice type speaker notes. There's also shortcut keys, which is control, shift and S which you will notice on all of these. Great. Have a go. 
see whether you would like to use the tool like this. Would it be useful? And stuff, of course. Please do add your comments in the chat. Let me know how you're getting on. Oh, so sorry. We've got some. Oh, Anita. Oh, very good. I love that. Board games, I'm loving that. Um, do you know, Anita, I'm finding that you, you find that it starts to type, it sounds like something, and then it goes back to the correct one. Of course, we can't say that it's 100%. It's how you're speaking. So if you're speaking very quickly, you're more likely to have some mistakes there. <laughs> Is that what you, you had on yours, Imra? <laughs> What were you trying to say on there? But yes, it can. Oh, yes, it has improved so, so, so much. It has um, had some issues. But I find if I speak slowly and it, it seems to like, like my voice, I don't have lots of mistakes. I do remember when the um, mistakes were epic. I do. But I am loving um, going back to Anita, your board game one, and also we like the interactive storybook. Okay. So. How are you doing there, Sharon? Hello? How are you doing there, Sharon? Are you um, just taking a pause to get some student, um, some people's interactions, or are you going back in to do some more bits? We're back into more bits at the moment. Wonderful. Wonderful. Can you see that? Can you see that yeah. on the screen? All okay, good. Fantastic. Fantastic. Anita has got fantastic ideas um, for using the uh, using things um, interlinking for board games. Loving it. Really like it. Um, so back to our slides. So we have our Q and A audience interaction. Sometimes you just need to make sure that your audience are interacting with you. Otherwise, it seems like it's one way traffic. So the next thing I'm going to show you will give you the tools in order to, to do this. So again, I'm going to come out of this and demo in my presentation and when you go to slideshow, there's a little down arrow there. If you click on it, it will give you presenter view. So I'm just going to go to my main slide here. Okay. And then I'm going to click on the down arrow here and go into presenter view. Now, this opens up into another window, separate window um, to your, your presentation. So we'll be working through a few of these. So you can see we've got our pre presentation here. This section is looking at the speaker notes. I've chosen a slide that did not have my speaker notes on there. We're looking at the audience tools. The audience tools is what will be using today so that I can see um, how much people have interacted here. So what you do, you start new. So this audience tools, start new. And this is a way of getting your audience involved. You can see that it's got on, it's got the actual link that's here, that link I'm going to actually put it into our chat. Okay. I'm hoping everybody can see that. And I'm going to actually click on this link so I can write a question in there. which again comes out in another window. So the question I'm going to ask um, at the moment 
is going to be how are you oh let's put um which google tip or hack will you be using okay and then this is what um nobody sees this until you decide to do this this is a behind the scenes now you can have your name in here and you can make it anonymous you can submit it and there we have it the question oh fantastic we've got wendy's one here but, but to show you what it looks like like if i just go back to our slides you will notice that we have the link on all of the slides. We've got that there. Now, I go back to my Q&A section here. In actual fact, I'm going back to my presenter view. And what you have is the option to present this. So if I go to present here it will show it and in my google slide you will see which google tip hack will you be using and it has it there and you've got anonymous here as well the good thing about this is that you you can see how people are interacting with your one people can choose to like and upvote we're not even going to go with the other vote here. Oh, thank you, Sandra. You, you, you've got Google Slides. Which part of Google Slides are you thinking? You love the presenter tools, Wendy, so that's good. So, oh, fantastic. Let me put a like on that. Quite like that. I do like that as well. So you can see how you can get your audience to interact with you. Um, you can feed questions in as you go along and you can take it from there. It's a fantastic feature, it gets everyone involved. So if you've got like a few minutes and you wanna ask questions, you go for it. This is what you would be using, okay? Um, I'm just going to go back to my presenter view and then I can turn this off. The questions can be turned off and then it is no longer showing in my presentation. So you can see it's no longer there. Okay. So that one was the audience interaction. It's such a good way of getting people involved. It's, that's an excellent tool to use. How much time have we got left, Wendy? You have two minutes. Oh, okay. So it's time for some quickies. Okay. So one of the ones, the tools that I really like is um, the tool with your shortcut key. I always like a shortcut key for things. I'm always duplicating and trying to save time. So. If I click over here, I've got an out of control mouse at the moment. All right, so if I click on this, and then if I just do control and D with, with the keyboard, it will quickly create duplicates of your slides. Oh, new elements drop down menu. Oh, very, very nice, Sandra. There you go. So that's one of the quick ones there. Um, the, uh, another quickie that I might be able to do before our time's up will be, let's go to the next one. Think which 
one which you guys like. We've done our Q and A. Um, we may not have enough time to add a timer or anything like that, but you can see that I've got an image here. You can see that it's in a heart shape and it's also in a cross shape. Ooh, I can do if you want. Yes, I can share that. It's got a lot more tips in there for you um, to, to um, you know, go and experiment with. But yes, I'll be quite happy to share the slide deck. Absolutely. If you guys want to work through them, have a go with some of them. There's a variation of things, and I hope you found that engaging, and I hope you'll be using some of these hacks and tips that I've shared with you. Thank you, Sarah. That was a really good session. And, um, you know, a lot of people just don't know that Q&A is there. And it's just so, so powerful. I use it to collect feedback at the end of training sessions. Sometimes if I'm doing face to face training, I find it really useful. Um, and it's a good way of modeling another part of the tool when you're doing training for people. Um, what was the thing I was going to say to you? I really, really enjoyed looking at the different templates that you found. I've seen Slides Mania before. What was the other one? Slides Carnival. Yep. Yeah, I've not seen that one before. Slides so I've learned something. The other one. So, yeah, I've not seen that one before. So thank you for, for sharing that. Um, some really great tips in there. As you say, you've done the same as me. You've put a lot in your slides that, you know, you've got more than half an hour stuff for. And that's great. If you share that link, we'll share it out at the end of the session. I've got the same. I've got a Google Doc, which is going to work people through Google Docs. It's far too much for half an hour. But I'll, once people have got it, they can work through the rest of it on their own. So it leaves, leaves them a little takeaway. So I think that's always a good thing. But thank you oh, very much fabulous. for this rest, the rest of this thank session. You Are you nipping straight off? Are you staying around for this bit or are you nipping straight off? I'm going to nip off at the moment. Okay. Well, okay. I'll say goodbye. Thank you very much. And uh, very we'll welcome. carry on with my session. Absolutely. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye. So that's Sharon going, uh, and you're left with me for the last session. So I've not got a slide deck for this one. I have got just a, a Google Doc because this section is all about tips and tricks in Google Docs. Um, not so much tricks, but little hacks or things that you might just not have noticed. Uh, and I'm going to give you the link to it here, bit.ly slash docs hacks that you can see on screen here. And if you go to that, it will force you to make a copy of the document. And then you'll have your own copy of this to play around with later, okay? As I've said, I've put everything in here and we can work through this by just following the instructions on the document. And hopefully at the end of it, you can, I'll have shown you at least two or three things that you've not seen before. So please, if you spot something you've not seen before, drop it in the chat, say, ah, that's a new one for me, okay? So the first thing I'm gonna sort of start off with is looking at the ad summary. And you can see, I'm gonna work through this document. So it's really, you'll see what's coming. There's nothing gonna be hidden here. So add a summary. If you've not noticed it before, up here, you've got the show document outline. And if you click on this, you've got uh, clickable sections that if I click on it, it can um, be like hyperlinks to certain particular parts of my document. So if you've never seen that before, I'm going to show you how to do that. But the very new feature that came um, how to add a summary. So if you're working in a busy organization and there are lots of documents in shared drives, Add a summary to it that tells people what it is. So this will teach you all about docs. OK, so you can add a, a, you know, a bigger summary than that. But that's the first thing. Learn how to create a summary. Uh, and then when somebody opens the document, they can quickly go. That's the document I'm looking for. OK, uh, very simple to, to use. OK, so the second thing I wanted to go through was headings and subheadings. So normally when I watch teachers that even have been well, not just teachers, but people in uh, education, sometimes we're so familiar with something, but we've taught um, ourselves how to use it and we haven't learned the best way. And we perpetuate that year after year. And I was guilty of this myself. So uh, when I saw people adding 
headings, for instance, they might just type the word heading. So imagine this is me typing the word heading. And I wanted this to be a heading. So what I was doing, I was making it highlight, making it bold, italic, uh, and making it a particular color or something like that. Um, but actually, that's a really poor way of, of breaking your document up. Because if you do that, there's and this is a long document, there's no way for somebody that's using a screen reader to actually jump through the document. As well as a screen reader, it's not very easy for anybody to jump through the document other than skim reading it. So let's have a look at how we made these subhead subheadings. If I type that again and put heading, and this time instead highlight it, but choose at the top here where it says normal text and select heading one or heading two, depending on what I would like, I can choose a particular style of heading. And as well as this happening, uh, by using those headings that are preset, it also appears on the left hand side in the outline, which means it becomes a clickable area that can anybody can just look through and click. So, ah, I want to know how to do page orientation. So I'm going to click on that section. So good design for accessibility is good design for everybody. Now, somebody, if they were using a screen reader to read this document, the screen reader would be reading it and it would say, add a summary. And the person would say, nope, that's not what I'm looking for. They could tab and it would jump to the next heading, which would be heading. Nope, not what I'm looking for. And as we, the sighted uh, people using it would you uh, skim read, somebody using a screen reader would use tab to skim read. So always use your headings and subheadings rather than highlight something, make it bold. Need to change permissions on the document sharing. It should be forcing you to make a copy. Is that not happening, John? So, oh, okay. There we go. Don't know why I've changed. Oh, no, that's not that's not my one. That's the one. It's this one. Let me just share this one. Oh, let's jump back to anyone. There we go. Try it again. Just refresh your document if you've opened it. But it should be forcing you to make a copy. Uh, thanks for that, John. I didn't notice. But it should be forcing you to make a copy. Let me know if you've managed to get in there. And I'm now working on the copy. I'm not working on the original document. Okay, so just let me know if you've managed to get into that one. I must have moved it and changed it. Okay, let me try a different way. Let me just... Okay, let's... Let's go old school and do it the other way. There's always ways of changing it. There we go. So anyone with the link as a viewer, that's what I'm going to give you this time. I'm going to copy the link. Rather than using the bit.ly, let's pop it into the chat. That should give you access to the document. I don't know why the bit.ly is not working. And then make a copy of it. So I don't want you to be able to edit this document. I want you to make a copy of it so you've got your own one to take away. OK, so that should be working, Jonathan. One of those should work. I don't know why. Yeah, hopefully that's working for you now. If you can, you can jump in and use the document then. So once you've got your own copy, you can carry on and just follow along with me. So headers and subheadings, really, really, really important. Thank you for pointing that out, John. I wouldn't have noticed. Um, I'm going to show you how to add a checklist. So that's pretty new in the documents. You can add a checklist from the top of your screen and it looks like a little tick with lines next to it. And that's called checklist. Or you can hold down control and shift and type a nine. And that will give you the first part of your checklist. So now anything that I want to become a, a checklist, I can just type in. OK, so the great thing about these checklists is you can just click on them and they can be crossed out as well. Now, where I use this is in activities for students. So if I was doing this with my students, I might at the bottom or the top of the document have all of these sections <coughs> as a checklist and ask them to tick them off as they've completed the activity. That works really well. Or if I'm using it in a form for sending out to parents, it might say, have you uh, dated this form? Have you put your uh, child's full name? Have you uh, signed the document and, and actually remind people they had things to do before they submit it? So that's your next thing that you want to look at. Add in a checklist. If you've not used Explore for research and citation before, this is always worth knowing because you get safe searches under here and Explore is in the bottom right hand corner. So if I click on Explore, there's a couple of things I can do. 
I can search. So if I want to look for something like penguin, I can just enter that. And it's decided it's going to go out of the document. It does that sometimes. I'm not sure why. Let me go again. Penguin. <laughs> OK, it's decided it's not having that. Let's close it down again. I think I'm going to be bogged down with things here. Let's try again. Search your docs on the web. Penguin. Sometimes you have to go slowly with this. There should be no reason that that. There we go. Weird. But anyway, we've managed to search. And I've got stuff that I can take from the web or images or straight from my drives. If I've got images that are called penguin in my drive, it will find them as well. But what I really want to do is just find an image of a penguin and just pop it in. And it'll make it quite big because I've uh, only uh, made it fit the page. But like anything, if I was using this in Microsoft Word or any other sort of word processing package, I can actually reduce the size of it. And I can keep the proportions just by using uh the corner handles to drag it now what's really great about inserting an image from explore is that you get an automatic link that takes you back to the page that tells you about the source of the image so if you're not sure if the image you're using is actually copyright free that link will take you back and and remind you and it's a great way to uh make sure that you're using stuff that you're meant to be using for its purpose okay once we've got an image in here, we can then look at how we text wrap. So if I now click on this image, I can just roll over the text wraps at the bottom and see what I want. And I might decide that I want to wrap this image and I can move the image around and see how the text is going to work uh, with wrapping around it. So nice and easy to change the style of your document just by moving the image. Yeah, smart chips also give you a checklist. They do. That came in uh, uh, quite uh, recently as well. So once you've put an image on here, um, and feel free, if you've seen some of these things already, but you can skip down this list and look at the ones that you're interested in that, that might be further down the list, feel free to do that. But if I right click on this image now, I can go into alt text. Um, so alt text, again, is for people that need to access this document by a screen reader. So they might be having trouble seeing the content. So I might want to put something like a title in here of Penguin. And then I might want to give some detail. So I, if I knew what particular type of penguin it is, I might say this is a picture of a particular type of penguin. OK, just for now, I'm just going to put some gobbledygook and click OK. And now if uh, somebody using a screen reader is accessing this document, it will come to this image. And instead of just saying image and skipping it, it will say image penguin and then it will read out the description so again just by making that simple change i've made my document so much more accessible and that's simply right clicking on the image and adding that okay so upper or lower case the amount of times i've seen teachers type a sentence and then forget they've had their caps lock on and they delete the whole thing and they type it again but um it was a little while ago when we got the feature in that you could change upper and lower case text. So for instance, if I've made this uh, word upper and I wanted it all to be in upper case, I can just double click on the word. Now, if you didn't know that you can do that, just double click on a word, it actually selects the whole word. And if I want something to select the whole sentence, I can treble click um, and that's a little time saver in case you've never seen it. So double click will select a word, treble click will select a, a sentence or a paragraph. So I'm now going to go to the format menu and I'm going to go to text and I'm going to go to capitalization and I'm going to go from lowercase to uppercase. And so if I've made that mistake and left my caps lock on, I can easily revert that text back now without worrying. So don't be typing stuff again if you don't need to. Another feature that came in just a couple of weeks ago was being able to select multiple selections of text. So before, as I've just shown you, I can double click on uh, a piece of text, but now I might want to double click on other ones as well. So I'm going to say, I want to highlight the word double and I'm going to hold down control and I'm going to highlight the word click and I'm going to hold down and, and I'm just going to really randomly select a few different words just so that you can see I can go through my document and actually select bits of text, which um, is a new feature. And once all these pieces of text are high lit, I can go in and do my uh, formatting to make it bold, italic, underline or a different color if I so choose. 
Okay, so that's a nice feature that you may have missed. It's only recently come in. So the next one we're going to look at is inserting a watermark. And this is nice and easy. We're going to go to insert and watermark. And you can select an image. So if you wanted to go in and click select an image, it will take you to a Google search so that you can go off and find a particular image that you want to put in the background. So I've seen people using this for sort of things where they want to make sort of watermarked uh, letter headed pages so they can use it for that. I've seen that. Um, but the way I use it is by clicking on text. And if I want to put something uh, that very clearly shows that my document is in draft, and I might want to put it in a, a, a red or a pale red. I can then click on done. And what you'll see is the word draft then becomes uh, interwoven into my document on all the pages. So that was the old style thing people used to do just so that people didn't copy their work. But uh, you can still use it for things so that people know which particular um which stage the document is. You know, you might put it on this has not been published or unpublished, something like that. So inserting a watermark, that's a pretty new feature. Uh, just make sure that you're aware of it in case you want to use it. I've seen a few people adding columns, um, but and it's very easy to do. So I've just put four lines of text on here. I'm just going to highlight my four lines of text and the instructions here tell me to format and then choose columns. So if I go into format and then columns, I can choose how many columns I want. I'm just going to choose two. So that's a very quick way of breaking up your text. So if you want your um, your document to look more like a newspaper layout, that's one way of doing it uh, very quickly. Oh, Sandra, that's a new one to you, uppercase. Hopefully that will save you some time eventually. OK. Now, Sharon already showed the voice typing, um, so I'll just do that very quickly. So again, this one's in tools and this one is voice typing. Now, the difference between the two is in slides, <clears throat> voice typing is actually in your slide speaker notes, but in docs, it's in the main body of the docs. So if I now click to speak, if it hasn't already uh, asked me to accept the microphone, it will start to type straight away. And if I uh, 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 stutter a little bit or forget what I want to say, you'll notice it's not picking up all those pauses. I think that came out actually 100 percent. So I'm pretty impressed with that. So speaking, uh, you know, your uh, voice typing, your notes. I've worked with this with students that are uh, students that have dyslexia. I've worked with a member of staff once that fell over and he broke both of his wrists, but he didn't want to stay off of work and he had reports to write. So I taught him that and he just wrote his report all like that. Um, we just taught him a few extra bits like how to put the punctuation in as well. And he could work, you know, like 95 percent efficient. Actually, I think he worked quicker because he couldn't really type very fast at the best of times. So use the voice typing, show people that need to use it. Those people that are really slow at typing, that really works well for them. OK, so page orientation. This was a feature I waited years for. You know, I've been using Google Docs since 2008. So um, I really wanted that page orientation because, you know, when you just get a report that you've got to put out and you've got one page that really needs to be landscaped because it's a big table. You couldn't do it for a while, but now you can. OK, so again, you can go to format page orientation. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to highlight a piece of text, first of all, or highlight just this whole section and you'll see why. So let's go to format, <clears throat> page orientation. And I can say selected content is going to be on a landscaped, a landscaped page. And when I click OK, what you'll see here now is that's my page. You can see the edges of it here. And if I scroll down, you can now see that this section that I highlight is on a page that's now landscape. OK, you can see the difference. And the great thing is the next page again goes back to being portrait. So that's a nice feature as well. I'm just going to come out and do control Z and that will take <clears throat> away what I've just done. So if you've never used control Z before, try that one as well. Now, this feature is brand new, the pageless documents. So we've just shown you how to make things landscape or portrait, and that's great. But why are we even making something that has that def uh, that definition? Most of the time now, 
we're not designing stuff to be printed. We're designing things that are designed to be read on screen. But we're still stuck with that sort of ancient way of saying we've got to set it up with pages that break in a certain place um, because that's what we've always done. But Google has sort of come up with the pageless document. So again, I can go into file, page setups. This is in slightly different place. And I can go down, not just to portrait or landscape, but actually this section, which says pageless. And what happens here is all the dimensions of the page change. It becomes one page, like a scrollable web page. And if I click OK, you won't notice much different other than I keep scrolling down and there is no breaks to the pages. OK, so what you're seeing now is just um, somebody being able to type and put anything on now the great thing is if i put a big dot uh, a big image in it will just fit so i can go in and i can change my table and it will just fit into that pageless document but i'm going to do control z because i don't want to stay in a pageless document for the moment because not everything works in it although i love it some things actually don't work like your watermarks won't work in a pageless document because watermarks are designed really for printed documents so you've got to work out what it is and um, uh, how your end result is going to look. Is it a printed or is it just being read on screen? And then decide which one works best for you. Any new features anyone else seen yet? Anything else new to any of you? OK, this is one of my favorites, actually, uh, translate documents. So I can go to tools and translate a document. If you've never done this before, this should be being used in schools a lot. And I don't know that it's being used as much as it as it is. So, for instance, it comes up with a new document title. And what I usually do is I take everything off of it where it says translated copy. And I normally put the name of the document and then I put the language that I've um converted it into okay that i've translated it into and the reason i do that is because if i do it this way round, if i've got 10 different documents in different languages it's the same document they'll all sit together in my google drive because it's the same name the only bit that's different is the end and all i have to do is choose the language that i want people to uh, be able to read it in and then i translate now i speak a little german but not enough to know if all of this is right but anybody that is an, um, a fluent speaker of any language, please try them out and tell me. What I've been showing some schools to do with these is when staff are working in the office and they need to get letters out to parents to have their version in English and then translate it into all the languages of the parents they need to send it out to that they've had difficulty reaching. And if they've got somebody in the school that speaks that language, just to read through and proofread it and just make sure that it's OK. It's got to be quicker to do that than to translate it from uh, from scratch. OK, I'm not saying it's 100 percent. I can't tell you that because I don't speak a language good enough. Ah, oh, Sandra, the translation to Croatian is very good. Excellent. I'm glad to hear that. Most people that have told me they're saying it's getting better all the time. And that, you know, you know, makes me really happy. But this should be used more than it is in schools because we know we have students from all over the world in our classrooms. OK, so do that. What it does then is it stores it in your Google Drive and you've got different copies. It doesn't translate the copy you're in. It makes a copy of it. So that's really useful. OK, so the other thing um, that's really useful is to give temporary access to a file so you can share a doc and go back and see the list of people you've shared it with. And you can click on the drop down and set an expiration date. So really simply, you've all shared documents before, I'm sure I can actually share this with somebody. Um, and then when I've done that, I can uh, send it. OK, I don't need to notify people. I can just share it. Um, and then once I've done that, I can go back into the share and I can have a look. And if I click now where it says editor, viewer, commenter, you can see there that I've got different things that I can do. I can transfer ownership. I can remove access. And if I want to uh, look around, I can see in my settings that I can change things like editors can <clears throat> change permissions and share or viewers and commenters can see the options to download print and copy. And what I've realized is I'm in the actual wrong type of um, 
uh, account to be able to show you this. But there will be a, another section here. I'm in my personal Gmail, sorry. Uh, but you'll see another feature here that just says expiration date. And it will say, I want this expiration to finish on a certain date. So all you do is click on it. It's so like uh, a date and time stamp that you select. And you say, right, I'm giving someone two days to look at this document. And then when you share it, it will actually just give someone access for the date and the time that you've said. And it will instantly uh, switched off after that time. And you don't have to go and check it. And that's the big time saver. Not having to go and check it is your massive time saver. OK, so we're just going to use comments for planning. So uh, very easy. Highlight something. Make sure you know how to put uh, a comment in. Very simple. Uh, I can add somebody's name and put that in. And I can say, uh, shall we change this? Great way to spark up conversation, a great way to plan things with people. I use this for planning all the time. So please make sure you try that out. And if you're working with students, it's a great way to give them feedback as well on their on their work. So we're nearly at the end now. Um, you can also add an emoji in your feedback. So if I now come back into my feedback here, uh, create a comment and then right click. Had you noticed that you could put an emoji? So if you've got a student that really needs to see um, that this is a great piece of work, uh, I can put that. Um, I can put I'm happy. Or I don't know what came up then, but I can put. Let's try that again. Put I'm happy and I can reply or I can put some text in. So you can actually add emojis into your work as well. And then we've got the last couple of things, which are smart chips. So this is something I think Sandra or John mentioned earlier. So smart chips are just clickable objects that pull information into your collaborative canvas. So you can actually go into the project plan. Um, and this is like a little plan that I might put together. And there is actually a project plan that you can use um, directly in the smart chips. But to access any of the smart chips, all you need to do is type an at. And then you can go in and you can look and you say, OK, so that project plan is this particular document and I'm going to put that in. So I've now got access directly to that document. We can look while we're looking at the project plan for that as well. We can also put another at in and start typing for a person. So if I want to put in uh, me again in a different account, I can do that and I can put the lead person in. But the great thing about the smart chips there is that it will, when I roll over it, it will actually let me uh, start a video call with that person. So it's really easy, or I can actually schedule an event with that person. So that's what the smart chip brings as an extra to it. Another smart chip could be a progress for a project. So if I'm doing a project plan, I might want to scroll down and just have a look at all the things that are in here. But if we keep scrolling down, there's more and more of them being added. But there is one that actually is a project plan. So if we click on the drop down, you'll notice there's a project status one already. And what that does is allow someone to select whether they started, it's blocked in progress or completed. So again, without me having to make that little drop down, it does it already. And another one I can add is the final one I'll show you. And that's not the final one on there, but we can scroll down and we can actually put a date in. So I can say, right, the deadline is actually uh, select a date and I might go across and I might choose August the 16th. Again, I can put this here and I can book a meeting on that date to sign off the work. So that's what it's um, looking at in the smart chips. Some great little features there. Anyone use the smart chips already? Obviously, John, you did because you showed me that. But anyone else seen that for the first time or not realize so many have been added now? Because that's actually something that's getting uh, more and more. One of the last things I'm going to show you is the building blocks. And these are little preset templates that are ready to use in Google now. So you get those from the insert menu. And you choose building blocks. Just got to find where they are. There we go. And you can do different ones. But the one I like is the email draft. So here I can actually plan what I want to put in an email. Who's going to be in the two, the CC, the BC, the subject, and then the main body of the email. Now. 
once you've done that and you've set this all up, you can actually email directly from here and you can preview it in Gmail and send your email straight away. But the other reason I like this is not just for productivity, but actually for doing things with students. So when I'm working with students um, and teaching them uh, skills such as formal writing for writing an email, I can now use this in Google Docs rather than sending them straight to Gmail where they might uh, start sending it to people. But I might just start say to them, show me what your draft would look like in here and let me comment on it first. And then you can uh, you can then transfer that straight into Google uh, Gmail. So that would be a nice feature and way to use it. John, yes, you've been sharing with Amazon. Yeah, it's brilliant. I love that feature. Really, really good. So I'm not going to show you getting more fonts because Sharon actually went over that in slides and it's identical. So, you know, you just click on the normal text here and have a look. OK, it tells you how to do it. Um, yeah, so we're on the last thing. Task, the paint, uh, the paint formatter. Oh, I'm dead on time. Look at that. So the paint formatter is this little icon up here that looks like a roller. But did you know if you click it once, if you highlight something, um, it will change it to the last uh, thing that you had in your memory. So let me decide. I want to make paint formatting the same as this text here. So I'm going to select the text I want it to look like. I want to paint the format and then highlight what I want it to uh, become. And notice now that the header has become like the body text. But it only does it once. If I try and do it again, it doesn't actually repeat that. But a little trick is if I do the same thing and I double click on the paint roller and choose um, to do my paint roller, I should be able to use it multiple times because I've double clicked on it. Now, that's a feature I've not noticed people using a lot. I see them doing it once, but they haven't realized they can actually repeat use it. And to turn that off, you just click it again and it's deselected. So, well, I've just whistle stopped through a load of stuff there. I'm just going to come back in and say to you, I hope, I hope, I hope you've learned a few little tips. And if you have, pop them in the chat. If you've liked what you've seen today from this session, please make sure you go off and tweet that and let people know. Um, and I just want to say congratulations and thank you for joining us. I've got a couple of little things at the end just to remind you. Make sure you fill this in. Look, go to gsummit.link slash Acer. You might win a free seat on any of the future apps, events, boot camps or summits. So not the free ones that are being sponsored by Acer. These ones are, are being uh, sponsored by Acer. So they're free for you to attend. But there are ones that are paid. Um, and there are face to face sessions as well. So make sure somebody's got a win. So it, it's like that old thing, isn't it? If you, you've got to be in it to win it. So make sure you do that and fill the form in and then you can maybe win a place to come and see some wonderful trainers do their thing. And that's the end. Sorry, two minutes late, but I just say thank you from me and Sharon and the rest of the apps events team and Acer for education. Please go back and look at this slide deck. We'll share it uh, in the chat in a moment. Please make sure you also go and look at all the resources we've shared with you and play around with Google and learn some more. Take care, everyone. Look after yourself.